been looking at in principles of life the basic youth conflicts seminar book and using it as a textbook to discuss as well as to begin to identify certain areas that are going to influence us in our appreciation of God, our relationships to each other, our ability to resolve conflicts that happen every day of our life, our communication techniques. It's going to influence us in every shape, form, and venue that we get ourselves involved in. And there are six areas of conflict that you should probably write down and get a piece of paper and maybe make a big poster out of it because these are the six areas that are going to constantly cause friction for you if you haven't solved them in some way, if you haven't resolved them in some personal application of scripture and Bible study as well as taking them to the Lord in prayer, then you will have baggage, six pieces of luggage you're carrying around with you that are going to influence everything you say, everything you do, everything you hear, and the way you look at God. Those six areas of conflict are, one, assurance of salvation, two, self-image, three, purpose in life, four, harmony at home, five, moral purity, and six, genuine friendships. Every one of those areas are an expansive subject and topic that needs to be expounded upon in order to grasp the magnitude of just what we're saying about how much of your life is involved in each one of these areas of conflict. Because if you haven't fully appreciated the fact that you need to grasp these things as a mature adult, then you are immature. You are literally hindering your own walk. You're walking along with a limp. You're stumbling along with the wrong pair of glasses on. Your equilibrium is off balance. You're out of sync with what other people are doing. You are not in cooperation with what the Word of God says that you should be about, which is a complete fulfilled, satisfied person in Jesus. Now, having luggage, that just means you got to know how to have a luggage carrier. You see, some of these areas you're not going to be able to resolve. Some of these areas you probably have carried for a long time and you don't know how to just let go of the luggage. Frankly, we in the Jesus movement just simply said, hey, you know what? Toss it, man. It ain't worth it. Throw it. Kip kill it, you know, get rid of it. And we just bounced around like bubbling, babbling little Jesus freaks, you know, kind of like enjoying life. But then when we got into other areas where we didn't resolve those things like self-image, then we began to get into conflict because it was easy for us to be deceived into building our image. Or we would get into what's our world vision? What's our purpose in life? Why are we going this way? And then we became dysfunctional when it came to actually existing beyond just the initial salvation experience. So each one of these areas of conflict need to be resolved in some way and identified that you can find in your life, because I'm not there, and in my life, because I'm here, how to resolve those pieces of the puzzle that need to come into cooperation with the Spirit of God. Last week we talked about assurance of salvation. <laughs> you know, it's like, huh. If you don't know you're saved, you ain't going to make it. You know what I mean? That's just it. We made this bold statement that said, go to church, get to church, get it right, get over it, get done with it, get real. You know, if you don't know you're saved, go do it. You know, go get right with God and get on with the show, you know, because you're just playing games. You're playing a mind game that's kind of like saying, well, I don't know if I'm saved, so I'm going to have these marvelous feelings, you know. Or, I don't know if I'm saved, so I don't know if I'm going to hell or not. I don't know if I'm saved because I'm trying to get away with sin on the side. Deal with it. you got to know you're saved. You know, go to a church, go to a Bible study, go wherever you need to do, but resolve that. You need to get that straightened down in your life to know that Jesus died for you. He paid the price for your sin. He's already eliminated all the confirmations and consternations and every kind of turmoil that you think you can have in the future as well as the past and the present, and you don't know that. Because if you know that, he who has the Son hath life, he who has not the Son of God hath not life. If you have the Son of God, you know it. If you don't, you need to know it. You need to go out, go somewhere, talk to a pastor, talk to a counselor, talk to a church, do whatever it takes, but pursue it until you know it. That's your number one highest priority in life. The first very one, assurance of salvation. Know you're saved, then go there. 
call, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, if you want to get bluntly down to it, you don't have to follow four spiritual laws. You don't have to confess that you're a sinner. You don't have to confess that this and confess that that and make it all around. You just got to know that God loves you and you got to know that God wants to change you and He's going to rearrange everything in your life in order to make you conformable into the image of His Son so that wherever you go, whatever you do, He's going to help you to go through it so whatever steps you need to take, go do them. If it's an altar call, do an altar call. If it's a baptism, do a baptism. If it's a discipleship, do a discipleship. Get to it. Get real. Get on with it. That's the point. So, last week we did discuss, or last time we were together, we discussed assurance of salvation. Now, oh, boom. Self-image. <laughs> eh. <laughs> If there ever was anyone that probably should not be teaching on self-image, I'm the one. Okay, maybe I should be teaching on self-image because I am the one. I had no self-image when I was younger. I was an ugly duckling. I quacked. Quack, quack. You know, I mean, I had such a poor self-esteem, which isn't self-image. You see, self-esteem is not the word self-image. Self-esteem is something that is inside of your virgin or vision or kind of garbled of self-image. Because the image you have of yourself is what self-image is. How do you see yourself? That's self-image. Scripture teaches that we are intricately designed and that each of our basic physical characteristics was prescribed by God and developed according to His plan. See Psalms 139, 14, 16. However, today the vast majority of people are extremely self-conscious about their physical quote-unquote deficiencies in themselves and an overwhelming majority of individuals would change inborn features if they had the power to do so. And since this book's been written, they do so now. By this means they are saying that God's workmanship is inferior to their desired self-image, and therefore he cannot be trusted in other areas of life. That's the bottom line. If you have an improper image of yourself and what God has designed you as and made you, considering you are his workmanship, created for good works in Christ, that you were intricately made and fashioned by his own hands, then you're going to kind of like not be able to trust him in other areas because you're going to say, God, why did you make me like this? I mean, that's what teenagers always say. Or at least that's what they used to say. Now they say, plastic surgeon, why did you make me like this? Let's be real. J. Vernon McGee used to have an interesting statement where he would say, hey, if the bar, need, if the bar needs painting, we'll paint it, you know? Meaning that, you know, at one point in time in the old days, there used to be this advocacy of no makeup, you know, and so, you know, it was pretty much a religious thing that, you know, there were a lot of denominations, a lot of churches saying, no makeup, and then they got into where it's too much makeup, and then it was kind of like, you know, you look like a hooker, because if you're a hooker, you had the dark eye shadow, and you always had that black line around both the upper and lower. It was called eyeliner, but, you know, it was like, that's how you could tell a hooker, was that they completely covered the eyes, like the Egyptians. Who knows? <laughs> you know I mean, I know these things because I researched them. Did I grow up with that? No. <laughs> you know, man, I was not raised in a conservative or ultra conservative or any kind of those things. But I have been in community where in the Orthodox community there's a certain amount of conservatism, but it isn't done to the extreme like you know some other people do. Like, okay, for instance, I can. Jewish orthodoxy, you know, you put on a wig, you know, a really good looking wig. I mean, a lot of the, the rabbis' wives or a lot of women, you know, will put on these really fancy looking gorgeous wigs because they don't want to uh, break the law that says that, you know, you shouldn't show your hair, you know, to another man unless you entice them so you can only show your natural hair to a husband. Doesn't make sense, believe me. I've seen those wigs. <laughs> That's enticing. <laughs> uh, it don't work that way. But the point is, image is what is causing the conflict. Image, not sight. You see, when you have an image of something, it is imagination and imagery. It's not the actual visual, direct observation 
of fact. God sees you in one way. He loves you. He doesn't see this imperfection of the flesh because you see this flesh is going to pass away. It's going to go back to the dust in which it was formed, came out of the dust in which it was derived. There is something more to you than dust. If you look at your fingers and your hands and your toes and your nose and your eyes and your ears and the mouth and the tongue and everything else, it's from the dust. Dirt. So if you treated your looks like dirt, you know, well, you, know, you might have a bad self-image. <laughs> but if you treat it as God's creative working process that he made a miracle out of who you are and the way you are, designed specifically for a peculiar purpose in life that he's going to accomplish through you just as you are, the way you are, so that you could go out and do workmanship that he has done in bearing testimony and witness because God had made you exactly right the way he wanted you to so that you could accomplish his purpose. Wow. That's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? As a matter of fact, if you don't know that God sees you as worthy, your self worth will always be poor self-esteem because your image of yourself is being derived from the wrong perspective. The wrong person is looking at you. Now, there's a lot of people that say, okay, well, fine, Michael, that sounds good. You know, I'm glad that God loves me the way I am and so do my parents, even though I'm ugly because I got a big nose, you know, and I need a nose tuck, you know, and I got a big chin because I need to bob that, you know, and I got like, you know, this is hanging down, so I need to kind of cut that and tighten it up and kind of pull it up, and I need to do a facelift, you know, I need to do a tummy tuck, you know, I need to get staples, you know. I need to do all these things that man can do so that I can change the image of the incorruptible God, I mean the image of the corruptible me into the image of incorruptible me, I mean into the image of uh, man-made me so that I could say that I made me in my own image. Really? You made you in your own image? I thought God was the one who originally made you the way he wanted you, and now you're making you into who you want to be. Because you didn't come up with your self-image of what you want to be based upon just yourself and God, did you? You want to change yourself because you saw someone else you want to look like. You said, they got small noses, I want a small nose. They are skinny, I want to be skinny. They got flat feet, I want to have, I mean, never mind. They got high heels, I want to have high heels. Oh man, they're manly, I want to put, I want to be buff. I want steroids. They're football players, I want to be a football player. Funny how self-image isn't based on self, but other selves that's the problem you're really not looking at your self-image correctly and that's why you won't trust God in the basic premise of conflict that you have right now you're not accepting what God has done for your life you're not accepting who you are unique distinctive and counted every single hair on your head by Jesus Christ himself you're not willing to accept that God can and does use those types of infirmities to cause conformity to what He wants done. You see, there could be people that have like a cleft palate, which is a split upper cavity on their mouth. And it causes a split of the lip eventually, you know, and it kind of looks like this, you know, it kind of goes up to the nose and it looks horrible. God allows that to happen so that we in compassion could come to that person and restore them to a normalcy if we are a missionary doctor going out to in the field in order to do that and to share with them Jesus as well as to heal them from that infirmity because then we demonstrate the compassion of God and the mercy of Jesus you see I knew very young at heart how I was so devastated inside that I couldn't talk to people. I was so terrified of them and rejection because I didn't have a father and I, I couldn't talk to my mother about things, you know, and, and she was very boisterous, you know, and very loud mouthed. I mean, she was funny, 
you know, but sarcastic, you know, she would just cut people to pieces with their mouth, you know, and just say things, you know, and tear them up, you know, in ways that, you know, would just be funny, but would hurt people's feelings. And so I grew up the same way, you know, kind of sarcastic and able to tear people up and down and sideways, you know, and do that to my sisters, you know, but I was never quite real about how much I was lonely inside. Because loneliness is what devastated my self-image. I didn't have the love poured upon me that I should have had in demonstrative love, meaning hugs and kisses and maybe pats on the head. No, <laughs> But the whole concept of being without a base, knowing that I was made this way and that God accepts me as I am, it's kind of like the song that says, I was made this way, you know, and you accept me as I am. Well, that song is trying to rebel against the way God made that person because it's obviously going in a rebellious way saying, hey, you know what, I'm who I am now, and you suck eggs if you don't like what I am because that person keeps reinventing themselves. But your image, the image that God has made you and the likeness that he's done in making you likened unto him, God designed you to be like Jesus. Yes, you woman, you man, you child, you baby, you whoever, you even disabled, you whatever you may be, you are in the image and the likeness of God. You have a body and a soul, and you're going to become born again. If you're not, if you're watching this, you should already be born again, because we already talked about church salvation, so you better be born again. But the point is, is that if you don't know and accept yourself the way God made you, you're constantly going to be questioning what God is doing and not accepting His will for your life in every area. So the first area that obviously comes to mind in conflict whenever you're dealing with any other imagery around you is going to be self-esteem because if somebody says something to you, you're going to flash on them. You said, what? What? Well, I said that, you know, did you see her big nose? And the first thing you hear is, you have a big nose. I do? I wonder what this thing sticking out is between my eyes. You know, I kind of I kind of noticed that there was something out here, but I didn't know that it was a big nose. Your image is going to be the thing that is provocable if it's a poor self-image. Now, if it's a confident self-image, then somebody could say big nose. I say, yeah, man, they got one made like me. Isn't it cool? Hey, we got noses. Yeah. The nose knows. Wherever it goes, that's where no nose knows. Because then you're confident. You go, man, God made me. Check it out. I'm his workmanship. He did a pretty good job on his nose, you know. He gave me a mole here and, you know, kind of like scar tissue here, you know, and kind of all this stuff here, you know, and I got like a birthmark here and I got this here, you know, and I got freckles and I got you know, gray hair and I got more hair than gray glory. <laughs> <laughs> Greg or Romaine, where are you? <laughs> Michael's picking on Greg. <laughs> so, God designing us has a purpose for that design. And God loving us is more than willing to share with us the reason for how He made us. The reason why it's a conflict is because if you haven't accepted yourself as you are, then you haven't accepted why God made you the way you are. And that realization needs to come to a perspective of accepting how God designed you and is holding you like this and looking you right in the eye and saying, I love you. I died for you. What more do you want? You want a plastic surgeon? Really? You want to constantly go under the knife in order to change what I've done with you and for you and gotten you ready for someone else that you could minister to that has the same defects that you have? Because what you call defects, I call objects that would be a bridge to cross over to share with someone the tenderness and the kindness and the gentleness that you will have because you now have a softened heart. You're not full of pride over your looks. You're not full of selfishness over who you are because you're not looking at yourself, but you're looking at the other self 
the image of who they are and what you can do to minister to them. Because one thing that's true when they say about love is blind, real love sees the faults. And because it's been loved, loves that person so much that the faults are just a joyous celebration of life. And in reality, that's what your image should be. You should be full of knowing that if Jesus died for you, and He's going to present you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy, and that you have a new body waiting for you, a new eternal destiny that you're going to fall into soon one day, and God has prepared that new body for you, then Jesus being scarred and marred more than any other man and will bear that mark for eternity, I don't think our image is all that important. Because if we deny ourselves, really, then our self-image isn't something that should stumble us. But if you don't straighten out your self-image, if you don't get over your past, forgive your present and realize in the future you're still going to fail in some ways, then your self-image is going to trip you up all the time. So if you see it happening, if you see yourself stumbling over that area of conflict, that number two that we mentioned in Principles of Life, because you see, there's a big book here. There's a whole variety of areas we're getting into a whole bunch of stuff in order to mature as a man and woman of God in areas like responsibility and conscience and rights and freedom and purpose. If you don't deal with these peculiar individual personal issues that's your baggage, if you don't learn how to carry your own baggage, or how to let it go. If you don't pick up that baggage, look inside and see what kind of like, you know, stuff you stuffed in there and deal with them one by one, whatever it is that I say now isn't going to help you at all. It isn't going to solve your issue. I can identify for you all the different areas that there are in self image. And I think there's forty nine, you know, areas I mean, not 49 topics, I mean 49 areas. You know, it's almost like 70 times 7, you know, but that's 490. But there's about 49, I would say, probably, more or less. You know, I could think of quite a few, you know, that I can run off the top of my head, you know, and just start begin to expand those outward, you know, with a factor of, you know, probably 3 to, to 7, you know, and then keep going on because I could probably expand those out a little more. But there's at least 49 different topics that I would normally just sit down and lay out, you know, when I was dealing with self-image, you know. And if I was counseling someone, I'd kind of, you know, if they wanted to do a logical one, you know, I mean, in counseling, really, because counseling boils down to this. Find the Holy Spirit, let Him teach you. <laughs> it's in, you know, done, over with, bye. You know, but, you know, if you really want to go through the, you know, sociological, psychological, kind of like, you know, emotional kind of, you know, dis differentiation between the relationship of the self, the ego, the id, the id, you know, I said, well, yeah, you know, I could sit down and talk to you about it for, you know, 49 different topics, and we could go through every one of them, you know, and identify them, you know, and you could kind of, like, make them into an outline, you know, kind of work on them, you know, and quote a scripture, you know, in order to fit each one, you know, and be bored. <laughs> but God would work it, you know, I mean, He can work it with you if you want to really do that. But you don't have to. You see, this is the shortcut version. The shortcut version simply says, you have six pieces of luggage you're carrying around. If you don't know how to carry it, then you need to deal with it in some way, but you need to just recognize you're carrying baggage. And the second piece of baggage that you carry is your self-image. If it's good, great. If it's not completely good, then you know, you're going to find out that some of your areas of conflict, when you run into those conflicts, go back into your luggage, open it up, and see if you're carrying something in there that maybe you shouldn't have, and you can point out to yourself that your conflict didn't come because that other person caused it, but what you were carrying in your luggage did. You see how we're getting that? Your baggage. It's your baggage, not theirs. Your baggage, your conflict, 
will come from opening up and finding inside your bug your baggage called self image something in there that isn't quite right and we all got baggage we're all baggage handlers we're supposed to kind of like you know deny ourselves you know hang on that cross and that way we don't have any baggage but I hate to say it if we're going to be honest in the modern 21st century American Christian not only do we all have baggage we've all gotten pretty good at carrying it around with us and we start beating each other up with it and we like to sling it around and throw it at each other and that's why we're dealing with these six areas of conflict and that's why you have to open up that luggage for this inspection by TSA in order to check it out you know and see what should you have packed in that luggage called self-image and so take that time because you can find lots of material out there and that's not what this book is about it's not about your self-image you know I said when I first started this study I said man I said these six areas I could spend six years <laughs> each one of them spend a year on studying <laughs> and talking about straight <laughs> but we won't do that but in this study of self-image knowing that it's a point of contention or a baggage you're carrying that you will you know cause or have cause to look at and have to open up and look and see if when you run in when you have run into conflict with someone or something or some situation see if it's not in your luggage you're carrying around in your self-esteem that's caused this conflict to happen or caused the conflict to increase or go on when you do the truth shall set you free Jesus said and sometimes just seeing it you can let it go and then when you do it's like that luggage gets lighter and then eventually you know you get rid of this whole piece of luggage called self-image because you don't worry about it. it's like hook self-image I got none I don't care <laughs> what self-image <laughs> you know, God calls me his own I'm happy with that that's about the easiest solution now most people can't live that way I mean they can't they have a self-image issue they get up in the morning they look in the mirror and they got to decorate themselves you know me I get up in the morning and the furthest thing I want to do is go to the bathroom you know I don't want to go in there man it's a waste of time you know shave I hate shaving you know get cleaned up I hate getting cleaned up man I'd rather go talk about God <laughs> uh, and it's only partially you know kind of exaggerations because really I really get tired of kind of like all this stupid stuff we got to do to take care of the body it's like and this is just you know badger skins this is just dead skins it's a tabernacle you know I can't wait till it dies and passes away you know man I don't want to take care of it I want to throw it away and get a new one you know let's check out and check in you know so that way we've got a new system going eternally but since we have to deal with each other we have to make sure some things are working <laughs> So, to keep your image correct in God, you can go to God and talk to Him about it. But if you get into conflicts, like I've said over and over again, and that's why I'm repeating it one last time, if you get into conflicts, start with salvation. Remember, you're you're saved. Nobody can take that away from you. You know, you're nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Neither height nor principality nor principality neither height nor depth nor principalities nor things about no things below shall ever separate you from the love of God and is in Christ Jesus so if you're in Jesus in other words if you have the Son and the Son has you if any man be in Christ he's new creation all things pass away behold all things become new and he that hath the Son hath life he hath not the Son of God hath not life if you've got Jesus if you have Jesus then you know you're saved if you don't have Jesus you aren't saved you're going to hell as soon as you have Jesus, you aren't going to hell. So do you got Jesus? To get Jesus. <laughs> and then, two, your image. If you got Jesus, what's wrong with your image? Come on, get a grip. You're going to heaven. You got a straight ticket to it. What are you going to worry about? Your image is assured. It's going to be changed into the image of the incorruptible God. You're on your way, Jose. <laughs> You're heading upward. You are out without having to worry about your self-image. 
Drop the baggage. Give it to a luggage handler. Jesus. Nail that sucker to the cross. And you probably won't. So that's why we deal with the conflict. And that's why we talk about the luggage you're carrying. Because if you're like every other Christian I ever met, you're still carrying a lot of baggage around. And that's why we're going through the principles of life. Could be called Baggage Handler 101, but once we get past these six conflicts, I think you'll get into some really good stuff if you haven't already. Because, Father, I pray that as we move forward in this principle of life that we have discovered about our own image, we realize our image is messed up because we don't see ourselves as you do. You loved us so much that you died for us. That's amazing, God. Not only is it amazing, but what's even more fascinating is you made all things according to your own counsel. You didn't ask me how I wanted to look, and you haven't asked anybody how they wanted to be. You just went out and created everyone in your own image. You created them after the image of your son, Jesus. And because of that, God, I thank you. And I praise you that you have made me, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I can accept who I am. I can accept the workmanship of your hands, that you created every single flaw I have, because you know the number of the hairs on my head. You have numbered every single one of them, and you got maybe six or seven for Greg left over. <laughs> but Father, even with Greg, you blessed him with all that wonderful hair when he was younger, and you blessed him with just a shiny bright light that comes forth shining off, I mean shining out of him as he witnesses. And God, I thank you for that, brother. But I thank you for all things that you created, all of us, uniquely and distinctly different. Each individual human being, thank God you made us different. And I'm so glad. And for those that have rearranged or rechanged or somehow made into some different image of themselves, then God, I pray that you would cause them to recognize that at this moment, now, they don't need to do anymore. They can stop where they're at and accept who they are. Thank God, if their baggage and luggage is such that they need to customize it and they have to cut off some corners here and kind of like, you know, make it into a designer luggage baggage carrier, you know, well, then God, help them carry it, you know, because obviously if they've already done some work, they're going to suffer the consequences of those actions. So Lord, help them in doing with and dealing with that. But for those who haven't, Lord, that have this sheer horror of who they are, and this sheer terror of life itself, Father, God, have mercy on them and fill them with your Holy Spirit to overflowing that they would no longer see themselves by finding someone else they might minister to and love on them through the image that you have created them to be, which is a servant of Jesus Christ, serving and loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, that they're so in love with Jesus they just want to share Him. And they're not worried what they look like. They don't care what they appear as, but rather they would share Jesus so that shining forth out of their innermost being would come the Son of God, a bright light shining in them that people would see that light and be drawn to them so that they could witness you, O Lord, our God. So, Father, help us, even those who carry the luggage and the baggage of assurance of salvation and needing the self-image somehow put back in the proper balance, that if they are luggage carriers, God, then you uphold them by the strength of your own hands and give them the Holy Spirit that they might be able to bear that burden until they're willing to let it go and set it down. But in the meantime, if they come into conflict, Lord, help them to open up the suitcase. Give them the combination so they can just flip it open and see what's inside. That they can begin to get rid of those things that no longer will be needful or they think that they have to have so that they no longer have conflict with other people, with other things or other circumstances in their life. Heal them, O oh God, I pray, as you educate them in the way that you would have them to be. For in your principles of life, O oh God, I thank you that you have given us life everlasting and eternity to come, that we can go from glory to glory into the image of the incorruptible God and become likened unto your Son so that the day would come when we would all shine as lights in the firmament. For surely, O oh God, that is our destiny. And I thank you that you have created each and every one of us that call upon your name to be that light. So God, shine upon us as we shine back and reflect that which you have done to us in giving us your image of your Son, 
as we live, as we breathe, and have our being in Him. Amen. God bless you. You know, you actually look pretty good to me. You really do. <laughs>